Hi everyone, my name is Dylan Irian. I'm a PhD student at the University of Cape Town down here in South Africa. And I'm also with Cape Rad. And Glenn has asked Mike and myself to give you guys a couple of guest lectures. Mike either already has or is going to speak a little bit more about what Cape Rad does. And I'm going to talk about some of my PhD work. Um, well, maybe not so much about my PhD. Uh, I'm, I'm hoping to improve population estimates for the white shark. Um, but I think actually we're going to talk about something a little more philosophical, and that's thinking critically about science and about sharks. So my hope is that after this uh, short lecture, you guys will approach the papers that you read and approach your role as scientists perhaps a little differently. Um, so to start, one of the things that I notice a lot, at least in motivating science, particularly with our charismatic shark species, uh, is that we are often sort of starting under the assumption that there's tragedy, tragedy and that, that is often the case, um, but I think might set the stage for some confirmation bias and clouding our judgment. Um, the reality is a lot of these animals are case-selected or show case-selected traits, and most of them are apex predators. So there's some concern for what happens to the um, ecology of their community if we remove them. And a lot of that actually came from what is now seen, or at least what very quickly was seen as a classical paper in the shark literature. Back in 2007, this paper, I apologize if you can't see the title, but it should be pretty easy to find. Um, but this paper kind of showed the first empirical evidence for that trophic cascade of you know, what happens when you remove an apex predator to the, the surrounding community. And the situation was off the east coast of the U.S. The scallop industry had collapsed, and so scientists were looking for the culprit. We've got a nice illustration of that here. So our pristine environment has a nice balance of great sharks, sort of at the top in the apex position. We've got cow nose rays. Those are our meso predators. And then the bottom, the producers, those are the scallops. And so what we saw was that after a, a reduction in the number of great sharks, um, there, there's no longer that pressure to, to keep the number of cow nose rays sort of uh, at equilibrium. And so their population expands and they overgraze or overeat the scallops. And that was sort of directly shown with fisheries data off the coast of the U.S. Um, it quickly gained a lot of traction in the news. I think species were petitioned to be listed on the endangered species list. There were campaigns to target cow nose rays for fishing competitions. There was a Save the Bay, Eat a Ray campaign. Um, and this was published in Science, so you expect a fair amount of peer review. Um, and it very quickly, like I said, became a classic paper in the shark literature. It was cited over and over and over again. Um, but not long after, the results of that study were brought to question by some other authors. And here they, they used alternative data. I think the original concern was that the quality of the original data set wasn't very good. And we get that a lot with fisheries data. Catches aren't reported properly, species are misidentified. Um, and so these authors tried to take an alternative data set, an independent data set, um, and they decided that in order for the findings to be valid, several criteria needed to be in place between the trophic linkages at play here. So we have the linkage between the predator and the consumer. That would be the, the apex sharks, sorry, the uh, the great sharks and the, the meso predator, the cow known as ray. And then also these linkages need to be present between the consumer and the resource, so the meso predator and the scallops. And the criteria were that we needed temporal correlation of abundance trends. So were the changes in abundance, declines in great sharks, increases in numbers of cow known as rays, did they happen at the same time? The next criteria was that there's a spatio-temporal overlap. So are these changes happening in the same place? And do the species exist in the same place? The third is that the prey population rate of growth of the popula population, not of individuals, is rapid compared to the predator. So when we um, remove a predator, does the prey population explode? And then the fourth is that the prey is actually a significant part of the predator's diet. So are the scallops a part of the cow nose rays diet and are the rays a part of the shark's diet? And then the last and final one is that the predator is actually the primary source of predation mortality for these species. Um, so for the rays, is it the sharks? And for the scallops, is it actually the rays? And what we see is that 
a fair amount of these criteria aren't satisfied. And so uh, we started the debate about whether the original findings were valid and kind of what the consequences of, of maybe rushing to those conclusions were. And I think that's something that happens a, a, a lot in science and a lot in shark science. And it's something that I want to hopefully open your eyes to and, and make you guys more critical readers of science before you blindly accept um, the findings of, of, of some of these papers. So in reviewing a paper um, that came out a couple years ago about the population of the white shark here, a book was brought to my attention by some co-authors. And this book aims to kind of group the role of the scientist uh, into four idealized roles. And this is uh, grouping the role of the scientist as we interact with decision makers. And I want to introduce these to you and, and hopefully encourage you to see maybe how you see yourself as a, as a young emerging scientist, because it's something that I think is quite valuable. So those four idealized roles, we have the pure scientist first. This is someone who has no interest in decision making. They published factual information to the scientific literature and, and they stop there. They don't engage with decision, decision makers and they don't aim to assist in the decision making process. Now the author argues this actually doesn't exist, except for maybe in, in naive and, and young grad students who hope that they're going to remain independent from all pressure. Um, but it, it doesn't really exist. So then the next idealized role we have is the science arbiter. And this is an individual who has no specific agenda and they're going to provide factual information within the context that they are asked. So if you think of a hotel concierge um, as the science arbiter, you might ask them, where is the nearest Thai restaurant? And they will say that the nearest Thai restaurant is 2Ks down the road. So they're not aiming to reduce or expand the scope of possible uh, decisions that you can make, but they're providing scientific, in this case, information. The third is the issue advocate. And, and this is where we're starting to reduce the scope of possibilities to maybe push the decision making into a certain area. So going back to that hotel concierge, maybe you ask for a good restaurant down the road and that concierge happens to be vegan. I don't mean to generalize that vegans are, are often advocates, um, but they would say, oh, the nearest vegan restaurant is right down the road and it's a great place. I highly recommend it because they're pushing that, that agenda. Um, the fourth and final, well, we, we do actually have one more hidden role, but the fourth is the honest broker of policy alternatives. And this individual would expand the scope of alternatives to allow the decision maker to reduce them with their own values. So this is sort of the, um, in the perfect world, utopian world, uh, world, we are providing all the alternatives, all the information that is available so that that person can then make a decision. Um, and now none, none of these are, are better or worse than another. And in fact, in a perfect democracy, we need all of them. To, to move forward. Uh, but there is a fifth and unwritten role here, and that is of the stealth advocate. And this is the individual that uses science or advocates for things under the guise of science. So they have an agenda, but they manipulate information either maliciously or ignorantly. Um, uh, maybe there's a, a confirmation bias that they're seeking and they don't realize it. Or maybe they are actively trying to push a certain agenda. But the, the stealth advocate is what kind of brings a bad name to uh, using science in the decision-making um, process. And that's something that I think I want people to be more aware of. So to, to bring this back to sharks, uh, we're going to look at a pretty classic paper in terms of estimating abundance of, of white sharks um, that came out about 10 years ago off the coast of California. So the authors use a very common method. We use photographs of dorsal fins, and we use the notch structure as a fingerprint. So each shark has a unique pattern of notches, and we can re-identify individuals from that. And then we build encounter histories, so how often we see each shark. And using those, we can, we can run models that will estimate how many sharks there are. And these particular authors saw about 130 
unique sharks, and their model estimated that there would be 219 mature and sub-adults. Um, and then the authors extrapolated that this represented half of the population. So they doubled the number, and that's, that's kind of the final abundance they came up with for the whole region. And like that original paper I introduced, this quickly gained a lot of traction in the news. It, it was an alarmingly low number uh, and resulted in a lot of uh, legitimate concern, serious concern for potentially listing the shark as an endangered species. Um, but I think what you might be starting to realize is when these things are rushed, that can be an issue. Um, particularly if papers haven't gone kind of, you know, there is the peer review process, which you expect to be qual you know, quite high quality. Um, but then there's also the afterwards, when the paper is published and people can try to replicate studies or disprove or um, build on findings, you kind of expect that to also happen before um, policy gets made. But sometimes, you know, we don't have enough time. But the issues can arise when those regulations place demand on the government. Financial resources are required to list species and, and put in place protective measures. And even sometimes um, groups of people are impacted by this. You know, if you're relying on a certain fish stock for your livelihood and you're no longer allowed access to that, you either have to break the law or not get a wage anymore. And so there's a lot to take into account here. Um, and I think the, the, the kind of overarching issue is that if we are listing a species that is not actually under risk of extinction, we are taking away resources from another species that actually is, and that, that can be the problem. So, you know, getting a species listed can be seen as, as an achievement, but it's not always the best, uh, it's not always what we're hoping to achieve um, if it's going to take away from resources from another species. So, like with the original paper, a lot of very well-known shark authors got wind of this original one and, and wrote their review, wrote their comment, uh, and, and basically went through all the assumptions that the original authors used in their model. A lot of populations, well, every population model comes with a set of assumptions that need to be satisfied for the results to be valid. But they basically went through one by one and, and uh, kind of discussed whether they were uh, violated or not. And so with uh, very simple closed population models, we have these assumptions here. Um, I'm not going to spend too much time now because we're going to go through one by one and, and look at what the, the review authors said, but here they are. Um, so we're starting with the first assumption, and that is the population under study is closed. So that means that during our study period, there are no births, there are no deaths, sharks don't move into the study, and sharks don't move out of the study. And in practice, this is very routinely violated. It, it doesn't often have a good basis in ecology. Most populations exchange in some way or another. Um, but provided that it happens randomly, it usually doesn't change our estimate of abundance. It just changes that precision around the estimate. And for sharks, we do see around the world clear evidence for seasonal patterns. So sometimes they, well here in False Bay, they often move inshore in the summer months and offshore or to Seal Island in the winter months. We see kind of similar patterns around the world. They might be the opposite, but seasonal patterns nonetheless. What there isn't, though, is evidence of annual patterns of return to seal colonies or any kind of consistent patterns of periodicity. So while they are moving seasonally, they're not necessarily coming back to the same place year after year. And that's the problem uh, for this model, because we might have individuals that are elsewhere during our study period, and that would be immigration or emigration. And in fact, the original study, the number of individuals cited each year increased year after year, suggesting that there was some kind of immigration into the study. The second assumption, that there is homogeneous sampling of individuals, so this means that every shark has an equal opportunity of being, of being seen or recaptured. Um, at the two aggregation sites that were studied in this one, and that they mix with one another. So I think, as I mentioned earlier, we do see that sharks show preferences, or show preference for seal colonies, um, but it's not a general preference. They actually seem to show fidelity to specific seal colonies, and that would, in turn, limit the mixing between them if they prefer a specific 
colony. So what we see then is that when we first sight a shark for the first time um, at an island, the next time we recite it is kind of inflated because uh, we're more likely to see it at that island than we would be if we were at another island. So we don't have sort of natural um, probabilities of encounter. The third assumption is that the tagging method doesn't affect the subsequent ch uh, chance of sampling. So here we're talking about um, after first seeing an individual, do we have the same probability of seeing it again? And this is a, a very important assumption here, um, especially when we're dealing with baited situations because we can influence the behavior of the animal by rewarding it or not. And so the authors here uh, kind of conclude that there's two ways this one could have gone. So with dominance effects, if larger sharks are excluding smaller sharks from the area, then we're not seeing a whole subset of the population, the smaller sharks. And that would actually underestimate um, the, the uh, abundance that we get from our model. And then the other end is that there's trap shyness, so that you know, when a shark is lured to a boat and realizes there's no reward for that uh, interaction, they're not going to come back. You know, they smell food, they don't get fed, they might not return. And so that probability of reciting uh, being lower would lead to overestimates, overestimates of abundance. And here the, the review author is kind of of the opinion that the overestimating outweighed the lower underestimating in this, in this study. The fourth assumption is that there is zero tag loss. So in traditional mark recapture, we would actually put a mark on an animal, a tag or um, some kind of a marking, you know, cutting its fur or cutting its toenails. Um, and we make this assumption that those don't get lost so that we are guaranteed to identify a marked individual. We don't misidentify them. Um, and here the authors, the review authors, don't really say one way or the other how this might have impacted their study. I do know that the periods between sampling occasions were about a year, so they would sample for a couple weeks and then come back another year over a period of a few years. So there is a fair amount of time for perhaps those notches to change. I've seen sharks whose dorsal fins get completely cut off by, by boats and other sharks, um, but there's no indication of, of how this may have influenced it. And that's because the authors actually didn't reveal this information themselves. So they did say that they discarded low quality photos, photographs, so there are pictures that were not included because they weren't good enough to make an identification. But there's no indication of how many of those were, how frequently that happened. So we can't really say what the impact was. Um, the last assumption, and perhaps the, the one that's most severely violated, is that um, the sampling in this study was representative of the entire central Californian population. So we sampled at two, the authors sampled at two islands and uh, kind of assumed that this represented the entire Northeast Pacific, which um, is simply not the case, especially when we see that sharks show fidelity to specific islands. So what we're actually looking at is, is a population estimate for those two specific islands. Um, that would be a subsample. Um, We've also seen from other papers, and I think the, the, the actual paper in question itself, that sharks reside at areas that are not ag aggregation sites or spend time associating with areas that are not aggregation sites. And so those would be completely missed in any population estimate based on just these two islands. So we're saying we don't have a, a representative sample. So it doesn't make sense to infer our findings or extrapolate to the rest of the population. Um, so several conclusions from this review. Um, first of all, that it's very difficult to, to do these models, and I think that uh, is not unique to any uh, to this study at all. I think the the authors just weren't transparent in the difficulty and the assumptions that may have been violated. Um, but despite any of these flaws, the, the original estimate is useful as a as a minimum for males. Those were the ones the sharks seen most in the study. Um, but any kind of extrapolation is misleading or might misinform decision makers. Um, in the end, the review authors simulated their own model taking into account these different assumptions and came up with a number that was about 2,000 individuals, much higher than the original authors, four or 500 or so. Um, 
and much higher than other populations like orca and polar bears, which a lot of authors like to compare shark populations to because we know that killer whale and polar bear populations are threatened, and so if our numbers are lower than theirs, then there must be a problem. Even though they have completely different life histories, ecological traits, carrying capacities, um, it's, it's actually a pretty irrelevant comparison, but happens, it's made all over the place. Um, so the findings actually place doubt on whether the shark should have been listed as endangered in the first place. The authors suggested that we shouldn't change anything about that because protection is good, and I suppose it would only cost more money to change that, um, but that the population was at least stable. Juveniles might have actually been improving, um, but going forward, we need to regularly monitor the population and use a variety of techniques so that there's clear transparency and that we don't have a biased opinion just based on one method. Um, and so to try to bring this all together, I think I want to bring it back to those roles in science. And um, I think it's important for us to, to regularly audit how we view ourselves as scientists and also to regularly read papers with a very critical eye. Um, and I think that a lot of times we have a, a confirmation bias within us that we are looking for certain findings. And those, whether we intend to or not, make their way into our publications. Um, sometimes it's done maliciously, sometimes it's done out of ignorance, and I think actually a lot of it comes from our lack of understanding of the underlying statistical methods that we use. And that falls on us, the teachers, because uh, I firmly believe we don't teach statistics properly. I was taught basically just, you know, given a bag of tools, your ANOVA, your t-test, here's when you use them, and go out and, and make science. Um, I, don't, I didn't understand how those tools worked and why they were appropriate in certain situations, and that's something that I think we need to change. Um, there are very easy ways to, to look for flaws, and you'll see them all over in papers. Um, I'll show you some at the end of the, the lecture here that I want you guys to go and read, but um, looking out for authors that don't use the right distribution for their data. So if we have count data, we don't use a normal distribution, we use Poisson, because count cannot be negative, and a normal distribution can be negative. For presence and absence, we use binomial distributions. Um, Interpreting p-values, we need to do that cautiously. Oftentimes we, we see uh, that magic 0 0.05 and we think, okay, we're good. Um, but, you know, things like pseudo-replication can influence our p-values and, and inflate them, uh, kind of leading us to make false conclusions. And then another thing that happens a lot is uh, using models that are not biologically meaningful. So now that we have computers and stuff like R, where we can fit hundreds of models with just our laptops. There's a tendency to, to fit everything, throw it against the wall, and see what sticks. Um, and that also allows us or sets the stage for, for making mistakes and using models that actually don't make any sense. So it's best to start with models that make sense biologically. Parameters are chosen to be you know, held constant or vary with time because it makes sense to do that, not just because we have the ability to. And then the last one, I think, is that we need to be transparent and we need to consider alternative hypotheses and not necessarily look for reaffirming those sad stories that we are expecting to see. Um, and so with that being said, I've got a few papers that I would encourage you to read and draw your own conclusions. Um, the first is the paper I mentioned that I made a comment on. So this is a, an old population estimate for the white shark. Not old came out a couple years ago. Um, you can read that. You can also read my comment, which is the next one listed here. There was also then a, a follow-up comment from the original authors. I don't have that listed here. Um, but then actually what kind of prompted me to make this talk is a paper that came out just a few weeks ago. And I want you guys to read that and have a look and see if you can find any questionable findings or uh, maybe some misuse of statistics. There are a few in there. Um, some Colleagues of mine are probably going to be doing a comment on that paper shortly. But yeah, I hope that uh, this talk has made you think about some things. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak to you all. I can. Um, I, I look forward to get, being able to do this again. I, I hope to have some findings from my own PhD to share with you guys. So maybe in the future I'll do another 
short lecture. Thanks, guys.